day, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to visit with you this fine day. You have no doubt come to visit to wish me well after my recent return from the Capitol and the disappointment of losing the last election. Now, I have been taken to task for missing the inauguration of Mr. Jefferson, but I needed to catch a stage before it that would get me to Baltimore in good time and on my way home, where I could be with my family, my friends, and my farm, but most importantly, with Mrs. Adams, my dearest friend. Rather than writing letters, I could actually be with my dear wife. Now, I still think back to my four years as president, and though there is much that could have been done differently, there is much that I am very proud of. Now, I entered office with the difficulty left by the Washington administration, and that was a disturbance with France. We had signed a treaty, the Jay Treaty, with Great Britain, offering us peace and trade. The French were much insulted by this. They had had a change in government, you see. They had gone from the monarchy to the directory after their revolution, led by Monsieur Talleyrand. And they were very much insulted by our signing a treaty with Great Britain. And, of course, there was the difficulty of parties. Federalists and Republicans, which I had to contend with. Now, even before the inauguration, I had reached out to Mr. Jefferson, my vice president, whimsically asking him if he might return to France and negotiate with the French government. And he stated quite clearly that he had no interest in crossing the Atlantic again. I mentioned the name of James Madison. He said he did not think he would go either, but that he would ask him. And of course, the answer was no. In any event, as I told Mr. Jefferson, the situation had changed, which he took to mean that the Federalists in my government would never approve of James Madison negotiating on behalf of the United States in France. So I knew I had lost any help that I might get from Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Madison, who went into retirement, and others, such as Mr. Gallatin. But nor would I get much help from my own government, my own administration, my Secretary of State, Timothy Pickering of Salem, my Secretary of War, James McHenry, and Oliver Walcott, the Secretary of the Treasury, who had replaced Mr. Hamilton. All of them were not taking their instructions from me, though I had kept them on in good faith from the Washington administration. They were taking their instructions from that little man in New York. And it would cause me great difficulty in my four years. Now, in my inauguration address, I spoke of the need to stop party politics and to keep ourselves out of foreign engagements. And I also spoke of the need to bring other members of the population into this country, giving them rights, such as the Indians. And there was much goodwill from my inauguration address. Of course, I had gone in just a coach with two horses and not a coach and six as President Washington had done. I even told Mrs. Adams that she needed to remove the Quincy coat of arms from our carriage back home. Now, I was greeted with applause from even Benjamin Franklin Bates of the Aurora, who was very much on the side of Mr. Jefferson and the Republicans. For a time I was popular, until there was indeed a threat of war with France and I believed that we needed to strengthen first our Navy, wooden, hall, wooden walls to defend our coastline and our shipping overseas, even created a department of the Navy under Benjamin Stoddard, one of my proudest achievements. But I did believe we needed to strengthen the Army as well. Now, it would not be the 25,000-man Army that Mr. Hamilton wished for. 
it would be considerably less, such as 10,000, which disappointed him very much. But he anticipated taking command because the commander-in-chief was to be General Washington, but he was of the age and infirmities that he would not take the field. Such was the pressure for war. Now, I had sent John Marshall of Virginia and Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts to France instead of Mr. Madison. And they would join Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, who had not been received by the French government. Now, these three men would have to wait, and they would only get a 15-minute audience with the French government or representatives of that government, agents that Monsieur Talleyrand and the French government expected money just for the insults they claimed that I had spoken of them in my inauguration address and the Jay Treaty and the like. Well, our representatives would, not, would do no such thing. No bribe was paid, nor would it ever be paid. And all was left in a huff. Now, the mail came from across the Atlantic, and the Republicans were so anxious to hear of this news of what had happened between our representatives and the French government. They demanded that we tell, and we did so, to both houses of Congress, and much to their shock, they heard of this, what was now called the XYZ affair, and the insults, and the French privateers still taking our ships for plunder. They heard all of this and they were very much embarrassed. I was very popular. Young men were marching about with black cockades in remembrance of Washington's army in their hats. There was a war fever and Mr. Hamilton took every advantage of it that he could. But I was still seeking peace and eventually there would be peace. Mr. Marshall would return home. There would be news that the French government had sent him away and Mr. Pinckney away, but had made Mr. Gary stay behind. Now, he had taken much abuse for this, and I had worried about him myself, but he secured peace with the French government, thus avoiding war. There was much embarrassment on the Republican side, first over the XYZ affair, and then by the fact that I had secured peace. However, the cost of it would be that I would find out about it after the election in November, at which I was defeated. Now, much of the defeat, as I have mentioned, had to do with Mr. Jefferson and his friends, and Mr. Hamilton and his friends, but also the passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts, which extended the time of wait for citizenship, and which with the Sedition Acts, allowed the government to arrest journalists who wrote slander against myself and others. It became a most unpopular act, though most Federalists were for, were for it. Mrs. Adams was for it, and I considered it as nothing more than a wartime act, which was needed at that time. No matter. With defeat, of course, I would, as I have mentioned in opening, make my way home to retirement. Retirement which will give me much time in returning to the thoughts of my farm and to my books, most importantly to Mrs. Adams and my family. Now I urge you, do not be afraid of the newspapers. Do not be afraid of opinions others might have of you. Be bold. Boldness such as this made me realize that I needed and would eventually love books, that I would gain an education at Joseph Marsh's school and at Harvard, that I would become a lawyer, that I would write tracts against all that was done against these colonies by the British government before the war, that I would stand on the floor of the Congress and speak for independence, that I would go to Europe, and I would negotiate treaties and secure loans from the Dutch 
and a treaty with the British government, of course, to secure peace. And that I would come home to a new government, which I believe was based on the Constitution I wrote in 1779, which was approved the following year, ratified. I would spend eight years as vice president in the shadows, but I would spend four years in the forefront making decisions which I believe were best for this country. And I believe that you should do the same. Good day and thank you. Greetings, I'm Abigail Adams. Doubtless by now, my husband John Adams has regaled you with the story of the birth of our nation and the important role he played throughout the saga. You may have noticed through the tale, however, that many of the characters, if not most or all, represented only a very, very small subset of the people of North America at the time of the American Revolution, and even the people of the United States of America today. The Founding Fathers were all male, white, well-educated, and property-owning. Having such a small, not diverse viewpoint of the world, of life, of the necessities of daily bread. The Founding Fathers created a form of government which was an American experiment. And just that, an experiment. Something to be tested, something to be tried, slight elements changed when necessary, and hopefully, God willing, eventually perfected. Before it even began, in the fall of 1775, when independence was just brewing on people's minds and the Declaration was months from being signed. I wrote to John, wondering, if a form of government is to be established here, what one will be assumed? Will it be left to our assemblies to choose one? And will not many men have many minds? And shall we not run into dissensions among ourselves? I am more and more convinced that man is a dangerous creature, and that power, whether vested in many or few, is ever grasping, and like the grave cries, give, give. The great fish swallow up the small, and he who is most strenuous for the rights of the people, when vested with power, is as eager after the prerogatives of government. You will tell me of degrees of perfection to which human nature is capable of arriving, and I believe it, but at the same time lament that our admiration should arise from the scarcity of the instances. The building up of a great empire, which was only hinted at by my correspondent, may now, I suppose, be realized even by the unbelievers. It will not 10,000 difficulties arise from the formation of it. The reins of government have been so long slackened that I fear the people will not quietly submit to those restraints which are necessary for the peace and security of the community. If we separate from Britain, what code of laws will be established? How shall we be governed so as to retain our liberties? Can any government be free which is not administered by a general stated laws? Who shall frame these laws? Who shall give them force and energy? Tis true your resolutions as a body have hitherto had the force of laws, but will they continue to have? Now, if you know anything about me, most likely you have heard the phrase, remember the ladies which I wrote to my husband, John, while he was working with Thomas Jefferson and others to develop the Declaration of Independence. Now, this very nice sentiment, but perhaps a bit over-distilled into a three-word sentence. Rather, I should like to read you a three-letter three exchange between Mr. Adams and myself. It might enlighten you a little further about the meaning and the background behind Remember the Ladies. March 31st, 1776. I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, 
I desire you would remember the ladies, and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion, and we will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Now, I must take a moment and ask you to forgive my husband, John, for his reply to this letter. He took the very serious matter rather in jest. At least I should sincerely hope this is jest. April 14, 1776. As to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. We have been told that our struggle has loosened the bands of government everywhere. That children and apprentices were disobedient. That schools and colleges were grown turbulent. But your letter was the first intimation that another tribe, more numerous and powerful than the rest, were grown discontented. This is... Rather too coarse a compliment, but you are so saucy, I won't blot it out. Depend upon it, we know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Although they are in full force, you know they are little more than theory. We dare not exert our power to its full latitude. We are obliged to go fair and softly. And in practice, you know we are the subjects. We have only the name of masters, and rather than give up this, which would completely subject us to the despotism of the petticoat, I hope General Washington and all our brave heroes would fight. All right, calm yourself. It enraged me just reading it all over again now, and my response to John was somewhat short-tempered. May 7, 1776. I cannot say I think you very generous to the ladies, for whilst you are proclaiming peace and goodwill to men, emancipating all nations, you insist upon retaining an absolute power over wives. But you must remember that arbitrary power is, like most other things which are very hard, very liable to be broken. And notwithstanding all your wise laws and maxims, we have it in our power not only to free ourselves, but to subdue our masters, and without violence, throw both your natural and legal authority at our feet. While equality and education for women was always one of my champion causes, Women were not the only people subjugated to a lesser state in the years of the early republic. At the time of John's presidency, when I was not just Mrs. Adams of Braintree, but Madam Abigail Adams, wife of the President of the United States of America, I had a bit of an interesting encounter with some of my neighbors regarding a young man in my employment a black man named James Prince. June 7, pardon, February 13, 1797. I have been much diverted with a little occurrence which took place a few days since, which has served to show how little founded in nature the so much boasted principle of liberty and equality is. Master Heath has opened an evening school to instruct a number of apprentice lads at a shilling a week. James desired that he might go. I told him to go with my compliments to Master Heath and ask him if he would take him. He did, and Master Heath returned the answer that he would. Accordingly, James went. After about a week, neighbor Faxon came in one evening and requested to speak with me. His errand was to inform me that if James went to school, it would break up the school, for the other lads refused to go. Pray, Mr. Faxon, has the boy misbehaved? If he has, let the master turn him out of school. Oh, oh, no, there was no complaint of that kind, but they did not choose to go to school with a black boy. 
And why not object to going to church, because he does, Mr. Faxon? Is there not enough room in the school for him to take his separate form? Yes. Did these lads ever object to James playing for them when at a dance? How can they bear to have a black in the room with them there? Oh, oh, oh it is not that I object, or my boys. It is some others. Pray, who are they? Why did they not come themselves? This, Mr. Faxon, is attacking the principle of liberty and equality on the only ground upon which it ought to be supported, an equality of rights. The boy is a free man, as much as any of the young men, and merely because his face is black, is he to be denied instruction? How is he to be qualified to procure a livelihood? Is this the Christian principle of doing to others as we would have others do to us? Oh, oh ma'am, you are quite right. I hope you won't take any offense. None at all, Mr. Faxon. Only be so good as to send the young men to me. I think I can convince them that they are wrong. I have not thought it any disgrace to myself to take him into my parlor and teach him both to read and write. Tell them, Mr. Faxon, that I hope we shall all go to heaven together. Upon which Faxon laughed and thus ended the conversation. I have not heard any more upon the subject. I have sent James constantly to the town school for some time and have heard no objection. I would like to conclude by giving you a bit of advice and a bit of a reminder. When times are difficult, when we are called to do things beyond our comprehension for the greater good, it is important to keep in mind that difficulties create strength. In 1780, I wrote to my son, John Quincy, another form, uh, eventual president, while he was traveling with my husband, John, in France. These are the times in which a genius would wish to live. It is not in the still calm of life or the repose of a Pacific station that great characters are formed. The habits of a vigorous mind are formed in contending with difficulties. Great necessities call out great virtues. When a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities, which would otherwise lay dormant, wake into life and form the character of the hero and the statesman. Well, good morning to all of you citizens. Uh, my name is, is Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, and of course I welcome you here to Monticello on a very special day. Uh, I understand that you are referring to this as President's Day. Uh, no one could be more in favor of recognizing the executive branch of our government than myself, because as you know, uh, I held it. But whether any one president of our nation ought to be recognized more than another, that is up to you. That is up to history. I would enjoy a conversation with you, if you will allow, uh, for about uh, 20 minutes uh, of my clock. That is the time I have here uh, this morning. So before we commence, will you allow me firstly uh, to remove my mask uh, that I might be better heard? For I understand that our nation is enduring a great pestilence thrown at us uh, by nature. Uh, so, uh, may I remove my mask? Thank you. And secondly, may I have a chair to speak more comfortably with you? My pleasure. You know, citizens, I must tell you that, uh, that wearing a mask and trying to protect ourselves from the vagaries of nature is certainly nothing new. Uh, this is not the first time, nor will it be the last time. I remember uh, growing up here in Virginia. We were besieged by what was called uh, the smallpox. Oh, it returned with a vengeance for decades until finally, finally, there was a vaccine. I wish it had been our nation. No, it was 
the British, one Edward Jenner, came up with a vaccine for smallpox in 1798. And three years later, when I was elected the president of our nation, then I promoted vaccination for smallpox throughout our nation. In fact, as I wrote, I vaccinated 70 to 80 of my family. Now, lest you think that my immediate family living here at Monticello were above 70 to 80, no, no, I'm referring to our families, predominantly the enslaved families. Those, uh, as you would know, were inherited by me after the death of my father and along with the marriage uh, with the widow Skelton, with whom I was only married for 10 years. No, it was my concern to maintain the health of the enslaved as it was my own family. And that was no less a concern as president in pursuing the vaccination through our nation. And coincidentally, when our government was seated in Philadelphia, it was there throughout the 1790s while we were building our nation's new capital in Washington City. Well, in the fall of 1793, nature hurled at us what we called the yellow fever. Oh, mercy, we had no idea where it came from. All we knew is someone would turn yellow. They'd be overwhelmed with fits and convulsions, excessive vomiting, and pass away within five days. In that city of 40,000 souls, 5,000 died from the yellow fever in only three months. In fact, the government had to go into quarantine. Oh yes, we moved several miles to the northwest of Philadelphia to the village of Germantown, and we wrapped up to protect ourselves, to protect others. We had no idea where this was coming from, and we almost lost our secretary of the treasury. Oh yes, he came down with yellow fever, but because he had it when he was a young boy growing up in the Indies, well, uh, he survived. But of course, that's been many, many, many years ago, so I doubt any of you remember who our Secretary of the Treasury was so long ago. What did you say? Alexander Hamilton? Yes, yes, it was Alexander Hamilton. I, I find it remarkable that you may remember him. I thought he had been long forgotten. Well, citizens, if you will, uh, thank you for continuing to bear up and for continuing to protect and defend ourselves, that is, all Americans, against this pestilence, and particularly to learn from it. This is something which I think the office of the President of the United States helps our nation uh, to pursue that we might learn and, and fulfill an education of the citizen body entirely. That was always my interest. Oh, I had that interest from the time that I was a, a young man going to school in Williamsburg. But the reason I was able to go to school was because my family had the monies. Well, I began to realize when a young man, simply because some people have the money, and may pursue an education should not mean that those who do not have the means ought to be neglected in education. I believe that the poor as well as the wealthy and the female as well as the male ought to have the advantage of an education. And so as a young man uh, attending the old Royal College of William and Mary, uh, reading law in Williamsburg, Virginia, well, I was well prepared to be elected to public office. Uh, my first public office was as a member of the old Virginia House of Burgesses. That is why, while uh, Virginia was a colony of Great Britain. And by the way, Massachusetts was also a colony, colony of, uh, of Great Britain. And the two of us, Massachusetts and Virginia, were the first of the colonies, no matter whether we were 600 miles apart, to decide to come together upon a common cause when we realized that Great Britain was trying to, well, quell and deny us the right to trade as we should choose, the right to purchase the kind of tea that we wanted to purchase, rather than to have the tea of one particular company the East India Company forced upon us. Thank heaven, in Boston, 
you all decided to do something about it. And that so-called Tea Party in December of 1773 was certainly heard far into the south in Virginia. And that is why the next spring, when the monarchy of Great Britain tried to close down the entire part of Boston to punish, punish all of those in Massachusetts, let alone Boston, for that indignity of destroying 356 cases of tea, that is why when we heard in Virginia this was happening in Massachusetts, we stood up and we called for an American Congress. A Congress to meet, not in Williamsburg, Virginia, or anywhere in Virginia. We called for a Congress not to meet up in Massachusetts, so far north from us. We decided that a Congress ought to meet midway between the northern and the southern colonies. That first Congress met in Philadelphia in September of 1774. Oh, I wish I could have gone. I wanted to go, but unfortunately I fell ill and was unable to do so. However, the next Congress, that Congress held in 1775, was my first Congress. That was where I first met Mr. John Adams. Now, I had long heard about John Adams. Oh, yes, he was held remarkable for defending. He defended the British troops in what was called the Boston Massacre, March of 1770. Uh, but here, in 1775, well, he was beginning to have a different opinion about British troops. Now, Mr. John Adams had attended the first Congress in Philadelphia uh, that year before in 1774. But in 75 was when we first met, and here I am, uh, six feet, nearly three inches. I continued to weigh about 190 pounds, uh, meeting Mr. Adams, who stood about five feet and seven inches, and who weighs about, uh, well, uh, he can be a big man. And we both had different accents from different colonies of, uh, of the British colonies in North America. However, whether North or South, we held much in common. And we worked together in that second Congress of 75. We worked on defending our colonies, the right to take up arms for that defense. And we also worked on what was called the Olive Branch Petition to seek a reconciliation with the Crown. Oh yes, we did. We did not want to incur war. But as you well know, when we sent those petitions to England, the answer that returned from them during that winter of 75 and 76 was no answer whatsoever, except what we read in the British newspapers. These colonies are now in a state of rebellion. We had no alternative than to attend to new business in the spring of 1776. And you certainly know what that led to. It led to the fact that when Virginia proclaimed itself the first of all of the colonies to secede on behalf of her sister colonies, including Massachusetts, well, President John Hancock of the Continental Congress in Philadelphia appointed a committee of five men to draft a declaration of American independence, should it be necessary. And of the five men on that committee, well, do you remember who they were? Dr. Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, correct. Mr. Roger Sherman of Connecticut, absolutely right. Uh, Mr. Robert R. Livingston of New York, correct. And your countryman, that's right, John Adams. And one other, thank you, Thomas Jefferson. Well, initially we thought that Dr. Franklin ought to be the one to write our Declaration of American Independence. But Dr. Franklin felt as he was getting older, he did not care to have anything else he would write suffer the scrutiny of a committee. A wise man, now that I'm much older, I understand exactly what he meant. But do you know it was Mr. Adams, John Adams, who then said that he believed Mr. Jefferson ought to be the author. In fact, Mr. Adams said, I believe a Virginian ought to be at the head of this business. I think he was reminding everyone that the business to pursue independency was 
the resolution of Virginia to begin with, as Virginia had been the first to secede on everyone's behalf. And so it was, I took up the pen to write our Declaration of American Independence. It, it took me three days to write that declaration on four sheets of paper. The reason it took so long is, well, I'm guilty of something we're all guilty of. No, not procrastination. No, I, I try to continue to work consistently in order to finish any project. No, I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And is it easy to erase ink? So you see, what I had to do was cross out the mistake and then write the correction above or beneath it. At the end of the day, I could hardly read my own writing. And so that evening, then, I would transcribe the whole thing that I had written during the day. And then the next day, that's right, I'd make more mistakes. Well, once I finished writing our declaration, that very first draft, and I gave it to the other gentlemen on the committee, and they had their suggestions and their alterations and their corrections, particularly Adams. He was incessant. He continued at it. But finally, the point being, working together, the committee came up with that final draft of our Declaration of American Independence and presented it to the Continental Congress there in Philadelphia. Oh, they argued and debated, yes, but remember, they were arguing and debating whether the colonies ought to cede to begin with. That had to be achieved first. We had the declaration there to remind us of why we were pursuing independency. And because of that, happily, thankfully, we finally voted for independency. Now, I will tell you, many Americans are want to believe that the 4th of July is the true birthday of our United States of America. But no, no, it is your countryman, Mr. John Adams, who will continue to remind you the 2nd of July. The 2nd of July was the day we actually did vote for independency. Mr. Adams will tell you we should remember that day every year with masked bands, bonfires, parades, illumination. And I certainly do not disagree. We argued beyond the 2nd of July, two full days, the 3rd of July and the 4th, until finally, finally, we all agreed on our Declaration of American Independence that the rest of the world might understand were the reasons why we were doing this doing this not only on behalf of ourselves, but on behalf of the rest of the world. You know, when I am reminded on this President's Day that there will be many, many more presidents after Mr. John Adams and me, uh, I have been told that there will be a president by the name of, uh, of Lincoln, uh, his name Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I am told that there will be a president by, by the name of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I am told there will be a president by the name of John F. Kennedy. Nothing could please me more than to hear the names of so many presidents whom you all will continue to place favor and trust in. I will tell you this, I am familiar with all three of those names. I have known people during my time by the name of Kennedy. Uh, in fact, I will tell you that I knew one Isaac Roosevelt, who was a very successful merchant in New York City. Perhaps he was an ancestor of the Theodore Roosevelt, later elected your president. And, by the way, <laughs> I knew two Lincolns. First and foremost, a very well-known and successful general of our American troops during the American Revolution was General Benjamin Lincoln. And furthermore, after I was elected president, well then, I invited one Levi Lincoln of Massachusetts to be my attorney general. So, you see, these are names that are not unknown to me, and coincidentally, while I am giving the names of gentlemen, that does not mean that I should dare ignore the names of ladies. Rest you assured, I have been long familiar with Mrs. Abigail Adams. Oh, yes, I so enjoyed her friendship. And, you know, I first met Mrs. Adams uh, in Boston, 
Oddly enough, it was in Boston. It was when I was making my way to Boston in order to sail the ocean to France. That was in July of 1784. I had not met her before that time. Uh, I had wanted to sail to France with Mrs. Adams because I was commissioned to be minister plenipotentiary of our nation, plenty meaning all, potentiary meaning powers, that is to hold all powers of our government, executive, judicial, and legislative, before the court of Louis XVI of France. Well, Mr. John Adams had already sailed to France. He helped negotiate our Treaty of Paris that formally ended the American Revolution. And so now, as Mr. Adams continued to reside in Paris, well, you can imagine he was very, very lonely uh, for Mrs. Adams. And so Abigail Adams decided to sail over and be with her husband, leaving Boston on the 4th of July, 1784. Well, I only hoped that I could make my way from Philadelphia, where I was living at that time, to get up to Boston in time to meet with Mrs. Adams and sail the ocean with her, and thereby be with her when she would be reunited with her husband. But remember, I know of no place upon the globe where you can travel any faster than a ship at sea or a horse on land. And no matter traveling horseback, how quickly and at what time I would hope to arrive at a place, a horse has a mind of its own. I did arrive in Boston on the 4th of July. However, the ship that Mrs. Adams and I had hoped to sail with her on would be leaving in only a few hours and they no longer had any room to accommodate me. Mrs. Adams and I had an enjoyable conversation and I, <laughs> we bon voyage to her as she sailed out of Boston Harbor. And so I had to wait until the next day. I sailed from Boston on the 5th of July. I will never forget that opportunity to visit Boston to be able to see for myself the, the industrious people, the bold people, the patriotic people that helped to pull our nation together. And I'm very happy that I have this opportunity to speak with so many of you who live in and about Boston on this day when we recognize all our presidents, no less Mr. Adams. And could it be, just referring to Mrs. Adams, that someday we might have a lady as a president? Well, there is nothing, nothing at all in our Declaration of American Independence or in our Constitution that would prohibit that. If that is what the people want, then that is what we ought have. You know, I've always said, having lived a long time, having remembered when we were colonies of England and then becoming our own nation, <laughs> as a child of 14, cannot wear the same clothes at the age of 40, so should our laws and institutions grow as we grow as the people. You know, citizens, I'm delighted to reflect on these years of our American Revolution, to have this opportunity to speak with you all so far north and yet be remembered that we were working together no matter how far distant from very, very early years and particularly to greet you here from Monticello.